there's this interesting Google search going around right now. Okay, talk to me about the yeah. Google search. And people are saying, you know, is $700,000 enough to retire? And apparently that's one of the most popular, you know, searches right now on Google. Right. And can you help? Uh, so we did a little reverse engineering, like a little did. snooping around, like, where did you come up with this number? Yeah, I really wanted to know. So yeah. I, I started prodding around on the internet. And apparently it's because people are kind of focused around, well, I think I might be able to live, or live on $40,000 a year. Mm-hmm. And with you know, trying to live 25 years in retirement and having that kind of safe withdrawal rate around 4%, that works out to be about $700,000 that you could draw on for 25 years All right. to live on about $40,000 So a year. we got to talk for a minute about the 4% rule. Do you okay. want to kind of go into what that means? Sure, sure. Yeah. Right? And just so everybody's aware, right? 4% rule is kind of like pirate code, right? It's guidelines, right? It's mm-hmm. not a guarantee on this thing here. But right, because we don't know what the markets are going to do. Yeah, yeah. And and we're we're trying to predict the future. But if you're kind of looking in the, in the rearview mirror, that what the four percent rule tells us is that historically speaking, if you were to take four percent of the value of your nest egg out each year, and you were to fix it at four percent, so the market goes up, you get a little bit more. The market goes down, you get a little bit less. But that the probability that that money would last 30 years or longer is extremely high. Not quite 100%, but very high. Right. So that has been traditionally viewed as sort of the safe withdrawal rate, okay? And I air quotes safe. You got an air quote on the radio, right? Super useful. You don't want to get sued. Right. So anyway, that's been sort of financial advisor shorthand for a long time. It's just say, well, 4%, it's 30 years in retirement. So it kind of does make sense that the 700,000 or well, that's 40 grand a year, roughly. Now, what can impact that? Sequence of returns, right? Yeah. You get several bad years right out of the gate. Well, and we've a had a wild roller coaster ride. We saw 2022 markets were down, or that was, we were up, what, 20%, and then 2023 down 20% or so, mm-hmm. and then now we were up maybe like 8 or 9% to start the yeah, year. Yeah. Yeah, I don't even know. The numbers fluctuate so fast. But right. And it, I have to recall, big, too, yeah, I think the catch on the 4%, well, I think the reason the math has a catch to it, if you just took 4% out every year, it ought to last in perpetuity, right? Because, right, 4%, well, even today it, 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 well, it might keep shrinking, Right? Oh, the account went down and I pulled 4% out. Now I take 4% of the smaller number out. You just keep taking 4% out. You don't run out of money because you'll just take a smaller and smaller amount. It's that but the whole, catch yeah. is you don't go backwards, right? If the markets go up, you can increase your 4% for inflation adjustment. But if the markets go down, you sustain the original 4%. But that's where the gotcha is. If you go through a series of negative years, it can sneak up on you. And all of a sudden you discover that you've taken so much out that you can't dig back out of the hole. Like you need, the rate of return is too high to fill the bucket back up after you've taken that much of an withdrawal out. Fixed expenses, you got to have enough money to live on. And that's where you're saying it can get dangerous. It's like- That's it. That's why they're not guarantees, but they are statistically really high probability, high enough that it's been historically used as like, hey, you know, you're probably gonna make it 30 years with this strategy, or potentially if you have a good sequence of returns, indefinite. Right, mm-hmm. you know, you end up with more. You, you die with more than you started because the sequence of returns rewards you, and it just keeps going. So it kind of, you know, it's it's a very swag estimate, but it's it, so suffice it to say, it's kind of driving this research online. Right, people mm-hmm. are looking at this, going, "Hey, you know, seven hundred grand can does that get me forty grand a year?" And if you know, in the event that you're looking at your own personal finances and you're saying, uh, "Well, I have this amount." and my lifestyle looks like this, do I have enough money for me to live comfortably? I think that's one of the areas that a financial advisor can be really useful is in helping you because, I mean, right, like we as a firm, we pay for software that helps us analyze that. And I think a lot of people, that's kind of what they're looking for. You know, I want to know that I'm comfortable and I want to know that, you know, things are okay. Now, does the software, is it able to, tell you with 100% certainty? Well, don't, no, no, nothing is, no. but but it can, it does probability analysis in addition to math, right? Exactly. That's the key to it yeah. is uh, if, if you want to go online and, you know, figure out a, kind of a, a simple calculator that says, well, if you earn this much per year and you spend this much per year and that works out long term, this is how long the money lasts. And you kind of see when you run out of money because it's pretty straightforward math. The problem is the variability, right? What happens when it's not 
a consistent rate of return. Here's another big variable. What if you have a really large expense you know is coming and that is going to change your financial picture too? Yeah, or here's an even additional variable. What if we change tax policy, right? And so exactly, Mm -hmm. all right, well, that'll throw it off too. So the idea is that you run a, a whole battery of different variables, you plot the outcomes, and then you look at the distribution of outcomes with those randomized variables and say, well, here we can kind of develop some statistical samples and give you a sense of whether or not it's likely Right? You're saying, well, 95% of the time it works out. That's pretty high probability. But if it's like, well, 16% of the time it works, but the other, you know, 84% of the time it doesn't, you go, that is not probably a plan that you want to really bank on because there's a lot higher chance of it not working than it actually working. Right? Too many things have to go right in order for that to play out versus the conservative approach is, well, what if a bunch of stuff went wrong? Does it still work? Mm hmm. I mean, do you have, you've been doing this a long time. Do you have any, you know, stories maybe of like where you've gotten into a financial plan or you've started really looking at the numbers and you've maybe even been surprised by what you found? Has there ever been an instance where you're like, I really didn't expect the numbers to say this, but here's a story I didn't really expect to see? Uh, well, sure. I mean, I think that there's, there's stories that have been both positive and, and negative. Right? Okay. Uh, positive stories tend to be people like forgetting variables. Okay. Mm-hmm. Oh, I assumed it was something like this, and I didn't know this was going to happen. Well, I've had that happen. Um, I had a meeting where someone, you know, kind of diagrammed everything that they had going on, and they're like, "Oh, you know, I was really hoping to be able to spend a little bit more in retirement." And then they throw in a, a curveball where they're like, "Oh, by the way, I've got a hundred thousand dollars of physical gold." And I'm like, "Well, that changes things. You know, if you want a certain lifestyle and you don't feel like you can have it now, have you thought about spending some gold, like?" cashing that in and, and using that asset. Right. And I've had situations where uh, folks forgot about a pension. Really? Yeah. Like, you know, it's, it's like, oh, it's sat there and then, well, I got to do this, that, and the other, and I'm going to run out of money. And they go, well, but but there's also this, and, uh, and, and I'm getting Social Security, or but I also have my military disability or something. Mm-hmm. You, know, you, you got to include that in the data point because that is going into the cost of living kitty right there. And so those are happy surprises when it's like, oh, there was more there than I realized. I wonder how many times errors, like, you know, there's an estate, someone passes away, and then there was an asset that was completely forgotten about in the mix of things. And then it's like, surprise, there was this other thing that even the person who owned it completely forgot about. Yeah, well, or just inheritance in general. That's sometimes a surprise too, is that people, well, I never counted on it. And then lo and behold, there was this inheritance and it kind of changed the game. Uh, you know, and I, I, we, I talk all the time to people about, well, I know it's morbid to count on an inheritance, but it's relevant, it right? Is. So especially if you're on the bubble and you're likely to receive an inheritance, then, you know, there may be some planning strategies that you want to deploy to improve the probability. Uh, here's a real life example. Like this, you're asking for here's a scenario. Sure. Okay. Had a couple where it was a his and hers, okay? And she was going to receive an inheritance, but he wasn't. The inheritance was the what made the financial plan go. But if she went before him, the inheritance went with her. So his plan didn't work without her. So what do you do? You buy insurance on her. And once the inheritance shows up, you can let the insurance you can, go. You can lap. You can yeah, you allow the insurance laps. to lap because you're just renting the insurance to cover that risk. That's ingenious. Yeah, so that's that was a, a real life financial planning case that uh, I have used before because the inheritance was relevant, right? And so yeah, and and so that that's a just kind of an example of how planning is a lot more than investing. Was this a plan you came up with? It was. That's cool. I like that. <laughs> yeah. So there you go. Um, one of those, you know, it's not even sleight of hand. It's just um, in the landscape of financial planning, you, 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 there's a lot of tools in the bag. Well, you and, just made sure that their plan worked for them based right. on what they needed. Well, and it's scenario based. Exactly. So what did they need? Well, they needed this set of tools. Not everybody does, right? I mean, I, it kind of bugs me when you get a product salesman that, you know, if you're a life insurance salesman, there's an expression. If the only thing you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And so all of a sudden life insurance is the Swiss army knife of financial products. Mm-hmm. It, it definitely has its use cases, right? And some of them can be very clever. Uh, but it's not the only tool in the bag, right? right? And I think it's important that you approach the problem solved that way.